Okay, well, let's get started. Welcome back to Engineering 340, 542, Dynamics on Networks, Lecture 11. We're going to continue our discussion of in-house models of infection. And I need to remind you that the course is live streamed and recorded. I'd like to start by catching up on student presentations. I had asked people uh, to do reviews of prior NanoHub apps, and I'd like to hear the last people's uh, presentations. I think there are still one or two people who hadn't presented. Uh, you had had an assignment, which was now getting a little bit old, which was to do an update on your project status. And so I'd like people who had that prepared to update us on their projects and go around the room, have everyone report on where they are with their projects and uh, seek help. Again, I encourage people uh, to work together on projects to team up, uh, complement each other's expertise. And uh, I still would like to hear a little bit more about the in-class uh, replication exercise you did two weeks ago. And then we will come back to the in-host modeling of viral replication and immune response. I don't know how far we'll get in the agenda today. So why don't we start out by uh, going over the uh, reviews of the NanoHub apps that people uh, had done. I, I think, uh, Delaney, I think you were about to present when you had internet problems the last time. So do you want to do that now? Sure, I'm so, pulling up the um, GitHub right now, actually. Just give me a second. And while we're while Delaney is doing that, Ali, do you want to present your report on the NanoHub app or not today? Um, can I do it next week? Next week is okay. Okay, I can share screen. So, my existing project was on synchronization in neural systems. And this occurs when the neurons are firing at the same time in two different individuals. And he does a great job in, here I'll pull up the actual web page. Oh. A second. All right. So he does a great job in explaining the biology of everything, but not necessarily the background of why it could be useful. So um, I put this in my PowerPoint, but I think something he could have included was the study that's been done between synchronization and mothers and babies, the newborns and how they grow up to have less social anxiety and become more successful in a social dynamic. But he does a great job at letting the reader learn about the actual firing of neurons by themselves and understanding the action potential, the actual sodium potassium channels that lead into an action potential. And then he does explain why he chose different units for the model because there is a lot of different mechanisms that go into neurons firing, so he did have to simplify it. So he chose the uh, connectivity, functional specificity, intracortical connectivity, and dynamical correlations. And he goes on to explain why those were the most important. And then he does give a mathematical model of the synchronization and explains each parameter, which I thought was really nice because it's all laid out for the user pretty well. And then he gives you a slider so you can see 
all the different variations and what could happen when you change different parameters. And this is just for the um, firing rates, changing the firing rates between two um, neurons or neural cortexes. He doesn't just use neurons by themselves because that would be way too difficult. There's way too many neurons to um, observe, but he does them in certain quadrants of the brain. So this is two quadrants that you can change and you can see them line up. And then he shows you in the phase space as well. So you can see their phase change, which is pretty cool for the physics side of it. And then he also shows you two, um, the one in blue and one in orange, different uh, core columns that did converge and come together and couple actually it just takes a little bit. And then he does, he encourages the user to change the parameters to model different simulations and situations. So he does go in and ask the user to do different examples. And they do, some of them lead to coupling and some of them lead to um, like a decrease in synchronization due to whether it be a shift in attention span or something else. And then, what was really nice was he included three cortical columns. So it would be three people instead of two um, synchronizing at the same time. And you can see that they all line up once you set them all to the same rate. And he does give references and additional information at the end. I have my PowerPoint as well. My brain. So what is neural synchronization? It is basically when two people have the same region of neurons firing at the same time. And it's typically achieved when they're engaged in some sort of activity together, mostly physical activity like team sports. When you're running at the same place, usually you start to breathe the same and your heart beats this starts to sync up. And then usually your neurons fire at the same time because you start to get tired at the same time and all the physiological symptoms go into, or synchronization goes into the neural synchronization. And then, so he did provide preliminary information on how neurons fired and the action potentials. And he also provided an external link to a video from Harvard University with a more in-depth analysis for the action potentials if you wanted to go into more of the uh, electrical pulse, sim signal impulse kind of study. And he included a lot of graphics to explain the ion potentials as well, the potassium pumps. Um, and then I included the differential equations and the parameters, because I thought that was a really nice touch. And then the different, the firing rate changes and the phase changes for the one critical contact cortex and then the two and the third one with three. And then these are his additional information sources, the neuroscience and biology side, the dynamic system side, and then his references that he used to build his model. And that's it. Okay, so, so one, one question is what what causes neurons to synchronize? Do, can you point to something mathematically or? Um... Yes, yeah, so he does include something, he calls it variable C, but it's called a coupling term. Right. And I can find it here real quick, how he did it. He included the mathematical model, but I can't seem to find it. But it is a coupling term and he uses Ohm's law to figure it out. No. There you are. Coupling term.
So, so do you expect that the secretization will be stronger when the coupling is weak or strong? When coupling is strong, your synchronization should be strong. I just can't seem to find it. So, so one thing, you're there, you're there. Okay. So in that picture that you've got, why don't you set the coupling to zero? They should be very different. And now you have to slide DV1 and DV2 to be different from each other. And so what you see, you should see here is that there are two periodic oscillators with different frequencies that have nothing to do with each other, mm -hmm. which I think you do. And now if you start increasing C, uh, you should be able, at some point it should lock. There you go, see? Now you see that they start out not in sync and they, they, they synchronize. Right. The rate of convergence plot, I'm not sure I, I understand completely. I'm not sure why that looks the way it does. Uh, yeah, I had a written analysis of it and I wrote that I wish you put something with a line of best fit so you could see what's going on or an ROC curve. It's a little tricky to define. So synchronization is defined by the phase difference between the oscillators. Right. And that phase difference itself, if you're out of phase, suppose you have a clock that's, that's slow by five, five minutes a day. Every, 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 well, we can figure out two of 24 hours divided by five minutes, every that many days, uh, the clock will be right. And so if you have two oscillators that are out of phase, I mean, that have different frequencies, Eventually, if they started at the same at the at twelve o'clock, eventually they'll they'll move at different speeds, but eventually they'll come back to the same time. They'll keep crossing each other at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so, so defining the the uh, the synchronization is is not a trivial thing to do. Uh, but this this picture you've got here is pretty good. So now, if you pull DV one to be bigger, for example, you should be able to get it to unlock again make it big enough maybe maybe not maybe it'll stay long okay yeah see now they're not quite the same even at long times mm -hmm. uh, and now if you make c bigger it should pull them back together yeah see now they're right on top of each other and now you could make c weaker and see at what level c of c they unlock See, now they're separate and they're not, they're not, yeah, now they don't know. So that's, uh, that's uh, sort of a nice base model. Now, now you, the one with three is also quite interesting. Um, again, we, we start with C equal to zero. And it's a little bit hard because these exercises are really ones where it's, it's, it's easy, it's easy to talk somebody through how to do it, but if it's on paper, it's a little harder to get make sure that people do it the way to, to learn from it. Okay, so now you've got all of your oscillators at the same frequency, so you expect it to stay in. So now you could pull V1 up a little bit to give it one frequency. And now V, say V3 down a little bit, or V2 down a little bit. There you go. So now everything, and maybe make the end time longer so you could see. I don't know if it, that works. Okay. Oops. That may be too much, but okay, that's fine. You could you could always change it. Uh, Two fifty, maybe. Okay, good. So you see, that's a mess. They're they're completely out of phase. Now let's see if you pull if you pull start pulling C up. What happens? See, now they're beginning to come together. And uh, okay. so they're all, they're all three locked. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes possible to get two of them to lock. If, if, for example, V1 and V2 were close to each other, 
and V3 were far away, you could get V1 and V1 and 2 to lock together and then not 3. So they're, they're quite interesting things that happen when you have three, three oscillators. And so um, I think, did, did, did you find it interesting to look at the, the app? I mean, he, he put a lot of effort into that one. I did. I really thought it was great. I really think the background was great too. He's, he's planning on going on to a PhD in this area. So, so I think, I think that's, uh, thank you for presenting it. It's a, it's a topic I personally, I find it of some interest because um, I, uh, hold on. I, it's actually the, the thing that I did at the very beginning of my PhD research. I was working on that. Hold on one second. Sorry about that. I don't know if it was bothering you. Uh, somebody started running a leaf blower just outside of the door. So I didn't want you to have to listen to that in the back. Uh, so, okay. So I think, I hope that that was interesting. I think your point about, about introducing the general issue of synchronization and that that could have been done uh, more effectively, I think was important and a valuable, valuable comment. Uh, and uh, I think also that, that this is individual neurons do synchronize. Mm -hmm. Within the brain, you do get synchronization between just single pairs of neurons or small groups of neurons. And perhaps he could have explained that a little more effectively um, right. as well. It's. Uh, this was this was a topic of tremendous research activity in the in the eighties and nineties, uh, and, and in some ways, uh, neural synchronization is the basis of thought. Um, if you look at if you look at patterns of brain activity, um, when you're quote having a thought close quote, uh, you see uh, diffuse activity resolving into uh, synchronized activity, locally synchronized activity. If you have too big an area of synchronized activity, you have an epileptic seizure. And so there's a fine balance in the brain between uh, appropriate levels of synchronization, which are necessary to do neural computation and uh, excessive synchronization, which, which is pathological. And we still don't really understand uh, fully how that uh, synchronization is controlled. It has something also to do with the, the pattern of neural connectivity. Um, and so there, there are a whole series of, of interesting problems about that. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I appreciated this, this uh, application also because it was quite different from the other ones. Um, since the, the context that the course is taught, been taught in for last year and this year was infectious disease, um, the methodologies work perfectly well for this. Uh, and so it was interesting to have a student go off and, and pick a different, different kind of problem. Uh, one of the students also worked on, on a cancer problem. And so while we've been focusing on, on disease modeling in class, uh, there's no reason you can't use these methods elsewhere. Does anybody else have any questions or comments while we've got the application up and you've got Delaney's attention? No. Okay, thank you. Um, 
So Ali, I guess we'll have you present next week uh, for your review. Thank you very much. It was great. Thank you. So we're still going to be on the student side of things here. Uh, is anybody, uh, I, I know it's a couple of people uploaded already two weeks ago, updated on their projects. I know Delaney, you may be speaking more than once today. Um, I'd like to have people uh, show their project state, status and updates if, if they're willing to. I can. Great. Put you back on. Didn't, <laughs> I didn't need to unshare. I could have left you. <laughs> could have left. You. I'm not sure if this is going to be my final one. This is one that I did start with. So I chose the mathematical modeling and numerical simulation of HIV infection. Sorry, my cat's trying to get my attention now. Um, so these are the models from the paper on the T, I, and R, which is the healthy T cells infected and recovered or removed T cells. And the model went very much in depth in the spread from the first infection and then all the way up to 10 years because the HIV could lead into AIDS. So it did go into a long time of the individual's life. So this is my first attempt at implementing the HIV model, um, the T, the I, and the V over an extended amount of time. And then, oh, I could, I have the parameter scan up on Telerium. I'll pull up in a second. And then this is how I could improve the one that I already have, the very basic TIV model. I could include preventative measures such as practicing safe sex um, or getting regular SC testing. And I could do this by using the procedure, the mask mandate for the COVID-19 exercise, basically having a, a herd immunity almost. And then I have my references at the end and I can pull up the Tellurium perimeter scan. So one thing I noticed in, in, in both the, the, the application you showed and in, the, uh, and in the paper you cited, they did these phase plots where you plot, instead of plotting the three parameters, I, T, and V versus time, they plot the values against each other to get the trajectory. And uh, Right, so there you have the trajectory of the two, two values against each other. Mm -hmm. and that can be very useful for determining whether things are oscillating, whether they reach a stable oscillation, whether it's chaotic and so on. Um, plotting that in 2D is easy. Um, instead of having the first axis be time, you have the first axis be one parameter, the second axis be another. If you want to do it in 3D, it's a little bit more work. <laughs> uh, but the application that you demoed has that. And so you could copy the code for doing the 3D plot from there. I if could. You wanted. That would be cool. Uh, so I, I always encourage people, in terms of text, I say, don't, please don't copy somebody else's text. But if <laughs> somebody has a code snippet that does what you need, uh, Go to Stack Overflow. Go to go to uh, go to Reddit. Go to anywhere. Any <laughs> find code that does the things that you need to do. Uh, use it. Don't 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 kill yourself trying to figure out how to do a three D plot. Uh, and so uh, specifically for this kind of well, see if you look at that bottom one, that's a three D plot of the trajectory in the three the three variables, right? And mm -hmm. G and the picture you have up on the screen. So that was a 3D plot there. Um, and there, where your cursor is right now. 
this one. Yeah. And so uh, if you wanted to recreate that, you could use the code that Jeffrey wrote last year uh, to do the 3D plot. So you don't Can I to... access that through the GitHub? Uh, if you go back to Tellurium, mm -hmm. this is an example, if, if you have it running. Wait, I, you oh, have... in the GitHub, and up this one. Okay, so there, if you, does that in, so, so hit, hit edit app. This is a lot of work. I see. So Wonderful. you can see all of this code. That is awesome, actually. Wonderful. I didn't know you could do that. Well, the default is to hide the to hide the code. Right. Because if somebody's coming in and they're naive user, you don't want them to see all the Python. But but it's all there. And one of the nice things about, about uh, the NanoHub apps is that you have access to all of that. So if you like some of it, you can cut, cut and paste. Wonderful. And I think you can download it too. I think if you go to file, you probably can do download. Let's see. Yes, you can. Huh? So Wonderful. Oh. Did it really try? Huh. I hope it's not locked on lost this. <laughs> At worst, you can cut and paste it. Right. But it should let you download it. I don't there know it why. Is. Okay, you got it. Right. I think it just might have timed out or something. So I hope I don't know if other people maybe maybe I should have made that clearer that that was possible because some, it's true, nothing is obvious unless it's focused data. And so I, now you've all seen that you can, in fact, if you see an application online that you like, gee, I love the way they plotted it. I love the way they laid it out. I love the way they formatted it. You can, you can hit that uh, show edit application and you can either download the code or you can, you can demo it. I mean, you can, you can, uh, you can view it online. Let's come back to your project and so Oh, I was showing the the parameter scans. Yeah. So this was the first one, the basic one. This is parameter sweep for the number of cells that thymus produce every day, number of healthy cells. And then I did all of the parameters just to see every single one. This was changing mu of T, which was the death rate of the uninfected cells. This is alpha replication rate of healthy cells. T max. Num maximum number of healthy cells per day. And then. Okay. Hmm? So one thing on those is that if you look at your, that slide five, where you've got the model, um, you could, you could leave, you could leave it, you could leave up what you had and then just, and so, so you have, okay. Oh, you split screen is good. So, so you have, um, the the number say of T cells is oscillating. And so that means that the final number of cells is going to depend on when you cut off the the simulation because it'll be different at different final time. So you might it's a little bit more work, but you might want to look at the mean number uh between the top and the bottom of the oscillation. So if I look at the, if I look at that oscillation in the in the left hand picture for example, you see this that the, the time series goes up and down and up and down and up and down. Um, 
So you could either look at the, 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 the value of the maximum of that and what it comes to, uh, or uh, you could take say the middle value, which will be more stable. Because otherwise, depending on the frequency, uh, when you cut it off at 70, if you say arb an arbitrary cutoff, um, that final value will be uh, different. And so mm -hmm. I think that oscillation that you're seeing here in the final number of infected cells versus the replication rate of healthy cells is probably because of the cutoff. And if you, if you measured the, the maximum value in the oscillation instead of the, the, uh, the final value, uh, you wouldn't see that that oscillation. It would be a smooth curve. Right. So I think you're. I think that's absolutely correct. Well, that's something you need to do. Uh, I mean, you've got a lot done. You've got you've got plenty of time to keep going on it. But if you're going to push out, do all the work of showing showing you what you've done, I want to want to try to give you some point some pointers. Um, so that might be something to think about. Um, and then displaying it in that, in that face portrait way. Um, if you look at their figure three, um, which is the phase portrait, again, um, there are a couple of different situations that can occur. One of them, is where the oscillations die out, in which case you'd see a spiral that would come into a point at the center. The other one is, what, is one where the oscillations either grow or shrink to a stable cycle, to a circle, or some kind of closed curve. Uh, in that case, the oscillations are persistent. And depending on what the, what the system is biologically, uh, that things may oscillate and your heart doesn't, as long as you're alive, your heart oscillations never stop. Uh, in your brain, some cells turn their oscillations on and then turn them off again. Uh, in the pancreas, there are oscillations. Um, there are also cells where, the os where there are oscillations that don't seem to have any function. The oscillations don't do any harm. So they're, they're, they're tolerated, but they're not, they're not functional. And there also are systems where you'll see oscillations where you go out, oscillations will you have an os a, a, a perturbation, then you'll have oscillations that die off, like ringing a bell where the bell gradually dies down. Um, and so there, there are significant differences in the, in the dynamics of the system, uh, depending on whether you have uh, smooth, monotonic, convergence to the equilibrium, uh, oscillating convergence to the equilibrium, or steady oscillations. And so those are all possible, I think, in the system. What you said about extensions, I thought was quite interesting. Oh, this, um... is, this, is, this is modeling what you call in-host dynamics. So it's modeling the the SIV state of a single individual. Right, I was hoping to do like kind of two models in one type of thing. So you could have, you could do, definitely do something like that where, where we've done epidemiological models. Right. You could say, well, if your viral load is high and you have some kind of sexual encounter, you're more likely to transmit the virus. Mm -hmm. And so then the probability we have in our base model, we have that beta, which is the probability of infection per encounter between uninfected and infected individuals. Uh, but you could have a model where the beta depend, the probability of infection depended on the viral load, which is probably true. I mean, that's more like, as you say, more like uh, wearing a mask, where even if you're infected, you're producing less virus and therefore you are, are less likely to infect somebody else. Somewhat surprisingly, I think I may have told this story before, uh, the CDC originally and the World Health Organization uh, denied that, um, deny maybe it's the wrong word, but didn't, didn't accept that the probability of infection was dependent on the viral load 
of the person who was potentially doing the infecting. And uh, Alan Perlson's modeling was a big part of uh, the reason that it was recognized that uh, in a sexual encounter, the probability that the, the uninfected person became infected was much higher if the person, the other person had a higher viral load. Uh, it seems like common sense. If I have a very low amount of virus in my body and I cough on you, you're exposed to less virus than if I have a high amount of virus and cough on you. Uh, and your probability of being infected should be higher uh, if, uh, if the amount of virus you're exposed to is higher. Um, but uh, for a variety of reasons that common sense wasn't accepted uh, until um, modeling showed that it had to be right. So that's something that you could add to the model. The other thing you could add to the model, of course, would be some kind of antiviral treatment. Mm -hmm model what happens if you take uh, if you take uh, Truvada for example right and you could you could see how that affected the, the, the health state of the individual um, you could even potentially include something where where there was it's a little bit hard in these kinds of models to do evolution mm -hmm. because evolution tends to be it's an agent agent type modeling but you could model a situation where you had, say, Truvada uh, as a drug treatment, and then that 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 gradually became less effective as the as the virus became uh, resistant to it. Uh, and those could give quite interesting results that can be pretty meaningful. That Again, is something to think about. I mean, I think I think this idea of 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 viral load in the individual and in fact has uh, affecting the infectivity is very interesting um, building those models may be a little bit complicated but could be very rewarding uh, you could just have, have the idea of say two you have two individuals and you bring them together and ask what's the probability of infection that would be a good start then you could build a bigger model around that um, but but i think also modeling treatment that uh, could be interesting here Something mm -hmm. to think about. I'm not, you don't have to, but it, it's possible. Possible if you're, if you're interested. Other other comments from the class. Again, people tend. Maybe if we were in the in the classroom, it would be easier for people to comment. But people should really. Again, I hope people uh, listen to each other and and help each other, uh, because. Uh, these are all explorations. I don't know this paper. I haven't worked with this paper. And so my ideas aren't, aren't any more valid than anyone else's. Okay. Okay. I think it's a, it's a great project and, and uh, definitely made some progress. And uh, you could, there's a lot you could do with that. Yes, thank you. Thank you for being willing to present. Is there anyone else? So anyone else? Uh, Colin, didn't you? Did you? You had uploaded a, a report, hadn't you? Um, yeah, but I don't have access to it at the moment. I can go over it next week. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, I'd like to get just even if you don't have something to show, I'd like to just get a sort of a project a, a status update from people. Um. I don't have like a presentation or anything, but I could do like a demo of. Uh... That would be great. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, for my project, I'm doing a. Uh, so far, I've done basically a recreation of uh, the model in this paper, which was made a very long time ago. So it's cool to do in uh, Jupiter with, and uh, so I've been adding sort of a more of a user interface with widgets and stuff to interact with this model and do uh, sort of manual parameter scans. And uh, basically it's a model of like uh, cell growth uh, factors and 
it's a sort of a cyclic interaction. And so there's three different states that it operates in, but basically we're looking for points when it is cycling and points, points when there's oscillations and when it isn't. So I've got my model here and uh, we can change different rate constants because these are the main things in the paper that were said that you can change. And uh, so I can change this to like, so there's a high end and a low end. So right now it's oscillating, but if I change this to a number that's too low, you can see it stops oscillating. And same thing with numbers that are too high, will fizzle out as well. Uh, but I've added buttons so that we can toggle each of these lines. And I kind of thought of that when I was looking at the uh, Nano Hub applications, when we were looking at graphs, it had a lot of stuff going on on them. Now you can just select exactly what you want to see. And, uh, but yeah, so you can just explore what these different rate constants do. Uh, and so I also have this plot, which I'm going to put in a better spot later, but uh, it's sort of a shows here. I'll set this and reset this cell. That's a very elegant layout that you have here. My guess is that some of your classmates might like to emulate your copy of the code for that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so there we go. You can see that these oscillations die down and so does this graph of these two. Uh, but I need to put more explanations for what's actually going on in this model. Uh, and I've also got this parameter scan for K4 and K6. And it runs through all these and we get this, uh, I forgot what the word for this is, this kind of graph, but. The bifurcation diagram. Bifurcation, yeah, all right. Uh, but yeah, so we can see these green points. I, I tried to get a legend going here, but uh, for some reason that's not working. But the green points are where it is oscillating. Uh, so you can see it's kind of a recreation of uh, this plot right here. So I got. you can see that I get sort of a similar result where there's this kind of smaller window down here and bigger one up here for I don't know why the labels disappeared but this is k6 so with a low k4 there's a very small set of values that you can still have it oscillate for k6 uh, but yeah that's what I've got so far and I just I plan on uh, for one I need to get this on nano hub but uh, I also I'm just trying to recreate more of these graphs and uh, sort of explore the things that weren't explored in this. Cause again, the point of this last thing here was to let the user change uh, these rate constants. And I don't have it hooked up yet to do that, but uh, yeah, I'm just trying to view what these other parameters do in this model and see when it, we still get these oscillations. But that's what I've got so far. Yeah, that's great. That, that was, of course, that Tyson paper was incredibly influential. Uh, there, there are lots of more sophisticated models. And, and uh, depending on how your time and, and, and presenting this material clearly with good explanations already is a lot. Um, if you find you have time later on, you could always add, use a, more, a slightly more elaborate based model and basically run the same run the same exercises with that because you have this beautiful way of presenting them. Uh, so you could you could look at uh, a model with extra components. Uh, one one thing that he does a little bit in that figure that that I think you you, you showed in his paper there in the middle on B. So in B, what he's doing is he's he's talking about how the parameters change uh, as uh, an organism develops. So 
in that. Remember, we talked about that together in figure two, you start at one, uh, the fertilization, then you jump to two, then you jump to three, then you jump to four and five and back. Um, and he's showing, I think in, in, number, in uh, B in figure three, he's showing what the time series would look like as the, as the cells are, are driven through the various phases of, of development. And so you could ask some questions about uh, what happens if you make certain kinds of perturbations to the signal. If you, if you uh, were to reduce the level of the cyclin, what happens to the oscillations if you were to increase it again? So how does the system recover after perturbation? Uh, or suppose you were in a non-oscillating state, um, you let the system equilibrate in the non-oscillating state, and now you change the value of K6. Uh, sometimes if you start out in an equilibrated state, non-oscillating equilibrated state, um, even though it would oscillate for a different parameter value, when you move it to that new parameter value, it doesn't necessarily start oscillating, or at least doesn't oscillate right away. TJ, do you have any ideas about fun things you could do with this model? It's a very, it's a very interesting model. Um, as I say, it's been a very influential one. Um, there are a lot of a lot of possibilities one can, can go with. Um, yeah, I mean, I I I think back to um, some more recent work um, that I've done with uh, coupling this with delta notch signaling, um, but that's. It's probably pretty far beyond the scope of um, something that might directly uh, come from this. Um, but this is this is cool. Um, it's very nice. Um, I don't know. I have to think about that one to, for something to kind of keep it in this domain. I mean, you could do synchronization. You could build two copies of the oscillator and then have the chemical leak from one to the other and see if they oscillate in phase. Mm -hmm. um, that, that happens in, 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 some, in some embryos, the cells divide synchronously. They all divide at the same time. <clears throat> so all of them, you go from two cells to four cells to eight cells to 16 cells. In other embryos, they get out of phase very quickly. And so they divide, divide more or less independently. And so that synchronization, desynchronization is something you can do. Yep. The, go ahead. One of the, uh, one of the more famous um, Boolean models um, is, is kind of in this realm as well. And um, I've seen that work extended to modeling adjacent cells and synchronization between them. And so it may be fairly straightforward to um, do something like add compartments here um, and look at those interactions. I mean, the, you, you face the usual problem with tellurium, which is it's really not designed to run multiple cells. <laughs> you actually have to have a physical copy of the code to write two copies of the same model. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, actually, Delaney wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily have known that, but, but it, it, this was something that Jeffrey faced when he did that project. The paper that he, he originally looked at uh, modeled the interactions of many, many, many oscillators together. And the problem was that in Tellurium, that would mean you'd have to have many, many, many copies of the same model. Uh, now, in, in Python, um, actually, you can't. There, you can't do it. With Roadrunner, only runs a single instance. So yeah, the um, the implementation that I've seen for um, this work using Boolean models um, essentially reformulated the mathematics. Um, so instead of um, simulating it. <laughs> compartments instead the system like the actual network was modified but probably that would be the way to do something like this 
uh, I mean, when I do it, I, I wind up copying that the, the model definition and, and giving them numbers. So it'd be CP2 and one, CP2, two, CP2, three, CP2, four, but it's not very elegant. Uh, it would be nice if you could have a vector, a vector of models. And, uh, that's not something that, that Tularium supports. Yeah, well, I could think of some clever tricks to do that pretty neatly, though, using some some basic Python functionality. Yeah, well, I mean, you could you could write code that would actually take it and copy it, and something that looks more like the Bionet Gen, right? Yep. Actually, this code expansion. Yep, that's what I was thinking of. Uh, but. But that is a limitation. If we were using MATLAB, we wouldn't have that, or Mathematica, we wouldn't have that limitation. But then learning the coding would be more work. So, great. Well, that's that's great. I appreciate you showing us that. Anything you want more you want to talk about about the project? Uh, I think that's all I've got for now. Okay. Who else would like to uh, uh, to talk a little bit about what they're working on? Uh, I mean, I've got, uh, you've already seen uh, over the weekend most of what I've got, but I can talk about the. Uh, Everybody else. Uh, since, uh, and sorry if there's a little bit of background noise. This one. No worries. So. Uh, just up at the top, I've got my uh, explanation of the uh, the article of the paper. Uh, it's interested in the singular question of how competition for resources affects viral growth in the respiratory tract. Uh, they highlight as how you will find uh, that the presence of one virus can repress another through competition alone uh, without needing anything else to explain the phenomenon. Um, it should be noted that part of the stated purpose of the paper uh, is as a starting point for in vivo experiment. So um, uh, it's possible that the paper is set up uh, in such a way that um, it is more uh, it is it is more um, oh I forget the word <laughs> uh, but it, it's more. Uh, it's more easy uh, to moving forward with it to be uh, to move forward to like uh, clinical stuff rather than uh, trying to expand up the uh, the model outward. Like uh, for example, uh, the uh, the data that was uh, used for uh, fitting the models uh, is not too easily available uh, from the paper. Um, uh, if converted uh, with just this paper alone as a resource for learning, uh, it would be to teach how competition for limited resources changes the dynamics of growth of viruses, uh, using those that are in the lung as an example uh, for showing when uh, competition alone is enough to suppress one virus. Um, uh, this model, though, could also be expanded to teach other ways that viruses interact with each other and the body. Uh, for example, interaction with interferon, which you mentioned, and then uh, vaccines, which I think are just always relevant. Uh, and then the paper itself uh, mentioned uh, immune preparation and viral proteins. Uh, though uh, such expansion is outside of the scope of the original paper and as well as uh, sort of outside of the scope of the original project proposal, which uh, when I did the project proposal, I don't think I fully understood uh, the project. So yeah. uh, I added a, a to-do list, uh, which turns out I don't know how to do text in NanoHub. So that's my, that's my next thing to do. Um, uh, and then- well, that's, uh, like, ooh, that, that's actually easy. So, so go, go insert, uh, or insert a cell above, go into the cell, and now go where it says code, uh, to the down, down, up, 
no, in the in the in the menu bar code. Uh -huh. code. Markdown. Type. And now I never remember, I never remember the commands to Juliana, do you remember how to say change the font size? Uh yeah, hashes are for title and headings. The more hashes, the smaller it is. Uh, so title is one hash, and so forth. You need a space before, uh, yeah, after the hashes. Yep, that. Um, lists to for a new paragraph, you need double enter, so two new lines. Uh, bullet lists is a start at the beginning of the line and then whatever you want. Uh, you add more bullets by having more stars. Numbered list, you start the line with one and the next line with one and it will render to two and so on. Um, yeah, that's what I recall from the top of my head. Then to have it actually render I think it's one period, and then uh, to have it actually render, you uh, do shift enter as if you were running that cell. Oh, all right, cool. Thank you. <laughs> yep. I, uh, so yeah, the, the plan was just to go somewhere and look up like a, uh, um, you know, a uh, some documentation on that um but yeah so i've got a i've got a to-do list uh the um uh, interactive interface is uh is a bit up there so yeah so uh if you could if you if you could point me in the right direction on that one uh, uh sorry it was drew who was presenting last yeah so uh, i'd appreciate that um, but then this is the uh, this is the model sort of generally I've put everything in zeros so obviously there's nothing impressive there. Uh, this is with only one virus and then uh, this is showing two viruses and this is the second virus when the first virus is not uh, is not present and so you can see that the first virus uh, sort of represses the second virus uh, through competition alone and then. Uh, there was some experimenting around with uh, starting the viruses at different times. So this is when uh, the first virus is started uh, at time point three rather than time zero. And then uh, down here, I did a parameter scan for uh, the starting times of the B1 infection and uh, plotted the maximum number of uh, the viruses. So, so one of the reasons that I assigned people to look at the, the projects from last year was uh, I can't, I mean, in principle, we can certainly teach some kinds of sliders and some kinds of formatting, but there are a lot of those that if I did, did all of that, it would take lots of lectures to go through all of that. And so, as I suggested to Delaney, uh, the, the, my advice is look at the examples from last year uh, and open it up. So you hit go from app mode to edit mode and you can see what the code was that generated it. And uh, when, when, I, when I, goodness knows when I'm going to write Python, I go to Stack Overflow or look for a code that does what I want. Um, sure, I'll look in the manuals too, but but it's really helpful to have examples. And since a lot of the things that we're doing are plotting using sliders and so on are going to be the same, uh, if you look at the way uh, last year's code was written, uh, you should feel free to say, oh, that's the sliders configuration that I like, and uh, grab it and, and adapt it for your purposes. So, uh, if you if you need help, um, how to 
how do I look at the code? How do I adapt it? Then please come to me or Giuliano and we'll try to help you out. Um, and and I did, I, I assigned, I, I tried to pick uh, examples from previous years that I thought were, were, were well done and interesting. Not perfect, because they're never perfect, but, but, but well done and interesting. And Josh also wrote one. And so I would encourage you, I asked you specifically to write up a review of a single one. I assigned each person a different one, but you might look at the other ones too and just see if they're features or, or uh, code, code com components that you'd like to use. So you might uh, scroll through it, run, run the examples and see, gee, I like the way these sliders are set up or gee, the way the, the, the graphs are laid out is nice. Um, there, there are some things that can be a little tricky. For example, uh, when you pull a slider, uh, the default is that it recalculates every time the slider moves even a tiny amount. And that, that can be quite slow because uh, if the calculation you're doing to plot your graph takes time, then the, the, then the plotting gets behind the position of the slider uh, and uh, it can be frustrating. Sometimes you need it to adjust continuously, but there, there's a setting to say only adjust when you let, let go of the slider, uh, this kind of thing. And so if you look at the previous year's examples, you'll be able to see what the code looks like to do that. Um, sometimes the formatting of the sliders is a little tricky. Getting the text boxes to work. Is just the way with, with a lot of the Python we do, the NumPy we do, Manipulating the arrays, selecting the columns and the rows is the most finicky part of it. Um, because the functionality in NumPy is very powerful, SciPy is very powerful. Uh, in the same thing uh, with the sliders, uh, the sliders themselves are easy, uh, but getting the text to format properly in the sliders, getting the sliders to lay out in the right row order, those things are, tend to be a little bit more finicky. Um, that's the kind of place where having an example is really helpful. The example might have two, might have a two by two grid, and you want a three by three grid. But if you see how the two by two grid is created, it's easier to do the three by three. Great. Okay, who else? Uh, let's get uh, quick updates from everybody. Who have we not heard from yet? And it's okay to say you're, you haven't done anything or, or are still working or looking for something. That's all right. But I do want everybody to report. Let's see. So we heard from Delaney, Benjamin, Cohen. So Drew? Uh. What do you mean? I've... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got you got to get back. It's Colin. So. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. Let me see what I have to pull up real quick. Um, if someone else is able to go quickly, I can have a few more things ready in a bit. Okay, Ali, did you did you want to say anything? Um, I'm I haven't done anything really, honestly. Um, but like you know, I've been talking to people, my my options. Okay, that's fine. As, as long as uh, if you, as I say, if people want to pair up, that's fine. Uh, no, no. Well, over the years, a lot of times people have done joint projects. It's not no reason that you can't do that. Okay. So, so Colin, I guess we'll give you another minute to get set up. Um, I, so then I guess the third thing, which was also student reports was, does anybody have anything more they want to add about the class replication exercises? I know last week I sprung it on you that you were supposed to tell me something about them. Uh, 
Uh, is there anybody who wants to comment more on the replication exercises? Giuliano, maybe you should. Have you had any more conversation with people about uh, that that broad, that that class and, and any more results? Um, no, I haven't spoken with anybody in the class about it. Um, not sure if people have submitted something on Canvas. I received some notifications there, but I hadn't had a chance to look into them. Does anybody want to report on that, on the replication exercises? I don't hear I don't hear a huge uh, groundswell of enthusiasm for discussing. I guess for next week it would be nice if people could, could tell me a little bit more about what they they were able to do. That would be fun. Let's say it's okay. So Colin, how do you want how shall we go ahead? Shall you want me to to start? Start the. Uh... Um, yeah, you can begin or go on with the lecture. I can pull up a few things that I haven't been able to access yet. I'm still working on it. Okay. Okay. So, in that case, I'll I'll continue a little bit, and then we'll come back when Colin, you let me know when you're ready to present. So I want to jump back now to our in-house viral infection model. And uh, you've seen this slide a lot. Uh, we started out by looking at uh, the viral load curve for influenza in mice, not human. And we talked about uh, the temporal regimes uh, and the ways of quantifying them. And we identified uh, a initial regime one, which was eclipse phase, when the initial load of virus has entered cells, but the cells are not yet releasing virus on their own. The virus has not yet had time to replicate and release. Uh, region two, which was when you had the Expo rapid exponential growth of the virus. Region three, when that growth slows down and reaches a maximum. Region four, which is associated with the innate immune system when the amount of virus decreases slowly. And it's not quite as slow as it looks because we have to remember this is a log plot. So the amount of virus is decreasing by a factor of 10 over between days two and day seven. And then this region five, when the amount of virus decreases rapidly and eventually goes to zero. <clears throat> and we thought about how we would quantify these regions. And uh, maybe in region five, using a straight line to approximate the time series isn't very reasonable. And, and you could maybe make the same argument in region two, because we only have two data points uh, within region two. So knowing whether it's a straight line or not is a little bit difficult. But if we look in these regions, there basically are only a couple of things we can used to quantify our results. Uh, in region one, the only thing we can ask is how long does it last? Because there's no virus, so the only thing we can quantify is the time. In region two, we can ask how long does it last? And since it's exponential, we can ask what's the uh, exponent? And we're gonna measure those exponents in how long does it take for the amount of virus to change by a factor of 10. And so in this exponential growth phase, you get a tenfold increase every 0.17 days. So over a day, you have a 10 to the sixth or 10 to the seventh increase in the amount of virus. 
quite a bit. Uh, in three, we have uh, the time of the saturation and the value, maximum load, in which the virus saturates. In four, we have the duration of the, the region and also the exponent. In this case, it decreases by a factor of 10 over five days. So uh, it's a factor of the, the rate of change. Uh, here we had 10, 10 per 0.17. Here we have 10 per five. So there is a 35 fold difference in the rate between the exponential growth and the slow clearance. And then we have that final rapid clearance. And as I say, it's not obvious that that's a straight line. But if we treat it as if it were, we see that the value goes from uh, 10 to the fifth to zero to, to a zero uh, over a period of about a day. Um, and my estimate here is a little bit slower than that, uh, tenfold over half a day. So uh, you could argue that. But again, the data, the points are so spread out, it's a little bit hard. Back. And then we thought a little bit about how the virus actually replicated. Um, this is a diagram for COVID, SARS-CoV-2 rather than for influenza. Influenza is not that different. It is pulled in by sialic acid receptor rather than by ACE2 or Tempris. Um, it looks like uh, SARS-CoV-2 also has other receptors besides those that have been identified so early. Um, and in the case of uh, influenza, there's also the additional complication that the genome is packaged into eight separate uh, um, blocks that are independent of each other. And so in SARS-CoV-2, you get one long viral RNA uh, in the case of influenza, you get eight separate viral RNAs, which will replicate independently. And uh, in influenza, they also, when it's packaged, <coughs> they wrap themselves around a core, uh, which doesn't happen apparently in SARS-CoV-2. On the other hand, the basic phases of viral entry, unpacking, genomic replication, uh, translation, turn the genome di uh, RNA dicing uh, to make uh, protein templates and then translation to make proteins, uh, assembly of the RNA and the proteins to make uh, protovirion and then uh, virion maturation and release. Those are all the same um, between influenza and uh, sars If you'll remember that, that, that influenza and SARS-CoV-2 are both single-stranded RNA-positive uh, viruses. Um, viruses come in a variety of types. Uh, they can keep their genome as RNA or DNA. Uh, they can be single-stranded or double-stranded. DNA naturally is double-stranded. RNA is usually single-stranded, but there are double-stranded RNA. Um, in the case of uh, a positive uh, gene, R, uh, RNA, the RNA directly codes for the proteins that it needs, that the virus needs. Uh, in the case of uh, a negative RNA, you have to make a single copy. A, co the co a copy of the DNA or RNA makes the complement. And so uh, the question is whether the, the original is the one that you need to use to make the proteins or whether the, comp, the, cop, the first copy is. And so in a negative RNA, you have one copy and then you make uh, the uh, proteins. Uh, in DNA, you have the same issue. You can have uh, positive or negative coding. And so then we built a very simple model that looked very much like our SIR model of infection, uh, where we had some population of susceptible cells. They were exposed to virus. Uh, they made uh, early infected or eclipse phase uh, infected cells. 
you know, those eclipse phase cells became uh, virus releasing I2 cells, uh, and they released virus. So that was our base model. And that was pretty much where we stopped the last time. Um, and we built a simple, uh, a simple uh, simulation of that. And we were trying to replicate the first uh, components of the viral load curve, namely the eclipse phase, which I've got here in red, and the exponential growth phase. So phases one and two, and then maybe beginning to think about the saturation in three. And we used uh, the parameters uh, for the rate constants, we use the parameters that we had here from our observation. That is, we assume that the uh, that the uh, k, which is the eclipse time, the, the rate at which cells leave the eclipse phase, uh, was four, which corresponds to one over 0.25 days. Uh, the exponential growth rate. Uh, is a little bit more complicated because it's going to depend on the population. And so it is something that we have, it's not so obvious to see it in that exponential growth rate. Uh, and then we assume that the virus, <coughs> okay, so, so one thing actually we didn't do um, last time. And so let's maybe do that as a first little exercise is, Let's see what happens um, if, instead of assuming that the virus is not used up when uh, it infects a cell, let's assume that the virus is used up. So instead of T goes to I1 at a rate beta VT, let's assume that T plus V goes to I1 at a rate beta TV. So why don't people uh, fire up uh, Tellurium uh, and try that out? Do people have uh, the uh, code from last time that we were all working on together? So maybe to begin with, before we even get that far, why don't people just get pull this code up and run it and make sure that they're still able to get the basic simulation to work. Any questions about that? People, do people remember where we were? It's been a while. If anybody needs help getting that working, speak up. So I'll give people a minute to, uh, to try to get that working and uh, I will launch the poll just again, you don't have to answer the poll immediately, but when you're, when you're done, and you've got it working, answer the poll so I know when everybody's ready to move on or if people have having problems. Juliana, it might be good to put a link into that um, demo. Uh, it's from a couple of weeks ago, so I'd have to remember what the the demo number was in the in the in the folder. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to look at. because we're gonna spend the rest of the class working from this code. So it's important to pull it back up.
if people are having any kind of problem, please speak up and we'll do our best to help out. And again, there's no rush. Just want to make sure everybody has it uh, running. Thank you for finding that That's helpful. Thank you. Professor, where is this um, like file? Just 
Sorry. Yeah. So, so, so this is the one that we worked with uh, last week and the week before. So you should have a copy of it. Um, if you don't have a copy of it, it should be in the student materials uh, under lecture. And Ali just said it's in. And so you said you. I, sorry, or were you asking? Is it the one? Yeah, under I was asking. I don't know where it is. Okay, well, so you should have it from from last week. Let's see, Giuliano, did you find it? I was just poking for it. So. Still looking. Um, I mean, re retyping it doesn't take more than a few minutes, but let me see if I can find it for you. Okay. So the one, so the one that that. Oh, that's great. Thank you. That's good. So, so the answer is, uh, Ali, the the one that's in under in the demo for lecture ten, uh, has this in it. It actually has everything in it. It's it's the incomplete. It's the complete lecture, uh, including all of the examples. So, so you could certainly pull that in and use it, uh, but in that case, you won't have much coding to do because it's all done for you. Uh, so I guess it's up to you to see whether you think that, that whether you'd rather uh, try doing a little bit of it on your own or whether you want to, to, to have the code as a backup. Um, Benjamin, thank you very much for, for sharing that. Uh, but, Ali, can you can you grab the the code that Benjamin wrote and use that? Because that that that's what you that. need. I mean, if you wanted to use the code that was in that in that uh, lecture ten example, um, the heading for the section that covers what we were talking about, what I'm showing here, is called virus production, and that code is is uh, is there. And in fact, that, that, that section called virus production is precisely the exercise that I wanted to do next, which is to, which is it compares the result when the virus is used up to the result when the virus is not used up. So if you if you've got if you're while we're, we're while we're thinking about this, if you're if you've got this working already, <clears throat> why don't you try this example, which is uh, change one line of your code. So instead of saying T 
goes to I1 at a rate beta VT, make it T plus V goes to I1 at a rate of beta VT. And the trick you're going to find is that you have to ask the question, how much virus is used up to infect one cell? In reality, the reason you can get away with what you see on the left without using up virus is that the amount of virus in circulation is very large compared to the number of cells. And so basically, if you have a million virus particles and you take one away, it doesn't change the amount of virus very much. Uh, but you can definitely uh, explore that. And so what I would do here, uh, if, you're, if you're done with the base model, is try changing the line T goes to I1 to T plus, and then alpha unfortunately can't be a variable here. Uh, it can only be a, a, a number, uh, but you could try T plus V goes to I1, see what happens. T plus 0.1 V goes to I1. Uh, T plus 0.01 V goes to I1. And you could compare the results and see what you get. Ali, was that working for you? Um, actually, I forget who said the code, but my laptop just died and I lost it. Um, could you send it again? Well, it's in the chat. I, I can't see it anymore because I had to rejoin Zoom. Thank you. Oh, okay. I did. I thought the chat. Okay, I might. My, my, I, I might. I didn't know that. I thought the chat was persistent. So you when you when you rejoin Zoom you you lose the chat. That's interesting. That seems like a bug rather than a feature to me. And to actually run the code. Um, I mean, there are a number of different ways you could plot that, but, but if you want to run the code, you could use something like this. So I put, put the, the Python in the, in the chat. So I'm just I'm just playing a little bit with that question. If you make if you make uh, t plus v goes to i one instead of instead of uh, t goes to i one, what is what is the change? Great. Ali, is that working for you now, or do you need help on that? Yeah, I think I'm all right for now. So it's running? OK. Did anybody try out this uh, this little extension where you, you say T plus V goes to I1? And if so, what did they find? Anybody wanted to, to, to share what they got?
Since nobody's speaking up, I'll, I'll do it uh, myself. So this is that demo, that, that lecture 10 demo, which has everything in it. Um, I'll start out here. I've got uh, one copy of the code that combines T plus V goes to I1. One copy that gives me the base model where there is the unmodified code and it doesn't display as well perhaps as it could. Um, the top one of these is the one where there's the combination. The bottom one is where is the default. Uh, maybe it would be better to uh, override, overlay them. Uh, let's see. But for the moment, I'll live with it the way it is. If I hear I've got uh, T plus 0.01 V goes to I1. And if I look at my two time series, uh, they're almost indistinguishable. If I make it T plus, um, T plus 0.1 V goes to I1, I see that the uh, infection is delayed but it takes much longer for my, my peak of infected cells. Uh, in the end, the outcome is the same. Everything that's infected, but it takes much longer. And if I actually tell it uh, T plus V goes to I1, that would mean uh, that the amount of virus particles was comparable to the number of cells. Then the infection doesn't take off at all doesn't start. Now, in reality, there are many, many, right. Um, in reality, um, you, get, you get flat lines from T plus V. Try typing T plus 0.1 V. So you need a tenth of a unit of virus to infect one cell. And the reason for this is that virus is measured in funny units. It's not measured in units of virions not measured in units of the uh, number of virus particles. It's measured in the infective potential of the virus. And so a virus load of one in this simulation is actually a lot of virus. It's millions and millions and millions of years. But why don't you try, Benjamin, why don't you try T plus 0.1 V goes to there, what happened? That's, that's more or less the simulation I'm showing here. 0 0.1. And yeah, you see, it's still in fact, but it takes, it takes two days to get to the viral maximum instead of a half, three quarters of a day. Okay, good. Ali, are you, how is it going for you? You're able to be able to get to it. I mean, I have like a plot, but I don't think it's right. So I'm just, or but I haven't like added the things yet. I was just like looking at the slide. Do you want to do you want to show? Do you want to do you want help? We can if you want to show your results, we can we can look at it together. I mean, like all I have right now is like the code that was sent in the chat, and then like it plotted. So I with like well do you have a plot that looks like the plot here on the screen where it's got your three lines and uh no okay maybe we can Juliano maybe do you want to try to help out or how do you want to do this 
Sure. Um, yep. Can put us I mean, in. I can do two things. I can create a breakout room where we can just do it together. What would you prefer? Alan? Or maybe a breakout room. Okay. Give me a second and I'll try to do that. Okay, so that doesn't leave very many of us in the main room, uh, but uh, one of the things that, that this tells you is that the assumption that you don't use a virus isn't a terrible one. Uh, I assumed it would make a big difference and didn't. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about biology. Um, when you're thinking about infection, um, there are a lot of uh, processes that your body uses to try to fight the infection. And they operate at different time scales in different, different, uh, in different ways. Um, these are all slides that were done uh, by one of the students last year, Sam. Heaps. And, and I should say that Sam was a, a, a much more of a virologist than I was. Uh, and so I may not be representing his slide deck uh, with the level of detail that he would if he were here to present it himself. Uh, one of the things that you have in the blood in, is uh, something called complement. And this is a series of, not, of non specific. Uh, non-specific components that attack uh, viruses. Uh, some of them uh, attack uh, the membranes of viruses uh, or uh, infected cells. Um, and then there also are, are other molecules that attach themselves to the surface of viruses. Uh, those can make the virus uh, more uh, visible to the immune system so that it's scavenged by macrophages or neutrophil. Uh, another, uh, or they can also cause viruses to aggregate uh, and attach to each other so that they can't enter cells and infect them. And so there are, there are a whole variety of, of uh, components uh, in the blood in, in uh, mucus uh, that acted to attack viruses. Um, in order to replicate viruses, uh, counter the immune system responses. Uh, and so uh, viruses produce proteins that, that uh, inactivate a variety of these responses. Uh, we won't go into all the details about that. Um, however, the key idea is that the virus uh, in the simulation that we've written here, actually it's not true, and this virus in this simulation we've got it decaying already. So I'm actually, we're actually up to this slide. Um, the virus, extracellular virus has a lifetime. Um, and that lifetime uh, depends on the environment of the, the, the body. Um, typically, the uh, lifetime of virus and mucus in the lungs is a couple of hours. Uh, and uh, in this case, I've assumed that the lifetime of the virus and mucus is about two and a half hours, uh, which would correspond to about 10 times per day. And uh, in fact, in the simulation that I showed here, <coughs> I have that included. Uh, I have the virus decaying to nothing uh, at a rate of about 10, 9.4 per day. Uh, if I didn't have that, and I could show that by turning off the decay, which I make it zero, 
uh, what I'll see is that um, actually it doesn't seem to make a lot of difference, does it? It's interesting. A little bit surprising. Let's see if I do this one. Does it make any difference? Doesn't seem to doesn't seem to make much difference, does it? And the reason for that, uh, well, I didn't plot, actually, I didn't plot the amount of virus in, this, in these graphs. The viral, okay, here's the viral load. Uh, so viral load is going up here around day two. Uh, day two, let's see if I turn back on the decay, what happens? Four. I wasn't planning to do this quite this way. You notice the viral load curve saturates. So let me let me run this now. Let me do it instead of plotting it this way. It's not ideal because I don't have the plots on top of each other. Let me see if I can get the plots on top of each other. Uh, plot. There's an in dot plot. See if those No, won't won't let me do it. Well, I'll just look at this one here. Uh, and because I'm unfortunately, I should have used m dot. I should have used plot array. I'd have more more flexibility, but I wasn't planning on using this code to demo. Uh, let's look at the viral load curves. Uh, here's the viral load with the decay, and the virus saturates at about one million at day one point five. If I turn off the decay. The amount of virus keeps going up, and at day one point five, I'm at ten. I'm at five seven million instead of one million. At day two, I would have been at one million in the other case, but I'm actually at fifteen million. So that saturation makes a huge difference to the amount of virus. So now we've got the basic viral load curve. And let's look at this viral load again. Let me fix this, put this back to being with the decay of uh, 9.4 here. And here's our viral load curve. And you'll notice that these look different because the one here is linear and the one here is logarithmic. So let me put um, the, let's see, it says, it says that it's, it, it says here that it's on a logarithmic scale, but in fact, it's not plotting on a log scale. Um, so somebody needs to, uh, instead of using m2.plot, let me use um, te.plot array. And then we'll have to display S. Oops, one did do wrong. Next time we'll as well. There. So now I've got now I've got it on a log scale, and I can compare it to my results here. And so here you see that there's a short delay where the amount of virus is actually going down early on, 
uh, then this exponential growth regime, and then this flat regime at the top. And I can ask how long does it take uh, for the virus to start reproducing? And if I chop everything off at 10 to the one, which I've done here on the right, I see it takes about a quarter of a day, which is about right. And then I look at how much the virus replicates uh, between uh, how long it takes to get to its maximum. It reaches its maximum around day 1.5 to day two, which is about right on the right-hand side. Uh, and if I look at what the value of that maximum is, the maximum here is about 10 to the sixth, the maximum here is about 10 to the sixth. So that means by eyeballing the parameters, by, by looking at the parameters one at a time uh, by hand, uh, this very simple model reproduces the first three phases of this curve. Reproduces the delay in phase one, uh, it reproduces the exponential growth in phase two, and it reproduces the saturation in phase three. Any questions about that? Or does that make, make sense? Okay. So uh, one thing that I could ask you to do here now, <clears throat> while we're waiting for Ali to get back, uh, is, to, uh, is to try uh, seeing how uh, the rate of virus production, P1, P changes uh, the viral load curve and also uh, the uh, decay rate of the virus. And I just showed you the decay rate of the virus. Uh, let me just comment these out so that if I'm going to run it here myself, uh, it's easier to see. I only have one plot, so we can actually see what we need. So this is the viral load curve. Let's do this together. Let's assume that the rate of virus production was twice as big as it was in a default. And what do I see? The time scale doesn't change, but the value uh, goes up a little bit. If I make the amount of virus produced per cell 10 times bigger, uh, effectively I increase, actually it speeds things up a little bit. The uh, virus reaches its peak after half a day instead of a day and a half. So that's fairly significant. And the value of the peak has gone up by factor 10. So we could, we, as we increase the rate of virus production, we speed things up and we increase the maximum amount of virus. If we take the rate of viral clearance and make it slower, it takes us longer to reach our equilibrium. Actually, it takes us longer. It takes about the same amount of time to reach the equilibrium. Um, doesn't look like we've changed the value that much. Uh, probably a little bit. It's gone up a bit. But if I make the rate of viral clearance 10 times slower, uh, I see that the amount of virus goes up by factor 10. So if I make the rate of viral clearance 10 times faster, and this is something that when I say, oops, if I make the amount of rate of viral clearance 10 times faster, I see that it takes a very long time for the virus to build up. And the amount of virus that I have is quite small, much, much less than 10 times less. It's, it's, an exp, it's in an exponent, so it's much smaller. So why don't people try playing with that a little bit, see what you get. You get something comparable or not. I encourage you when you're changing values, parameter values, to do what I did here, which is to leave the original parameter value alone and multiply or divide by something rather than changing the value. If you change the value, you don't remember what you type. You don't always remember what you type. If you multiply the original value by an amount, then it's easier to keep track. Okay. 
so I'll let people, uh, I'll poll you again, see if you're, if people are able to, uh, to get some interesting results. You've more or less seen the results, but it's worth playing with them. If I were going to try to be a little bit more serious about this, I probably would plot the original curve on top of the modified curve so that you can see more easily how the, how the result changes when you do that change. But for now, doing it by hand is fine. One thing that could be potentially interesting is to change, multiply P and C by the same amount. And if you do that, you should find that the equilibrium value is the same. So if I multiply P by 100 and C by 100, what happens. The amount of virus initially goes down very rapidly, but I actually come back on the same time scale to the same value. And so if I multiply both of those by the same constant, basically I get the same. Anybody have any questions on that little exercise? Okay. So I have a few more biology slides, which I'll go through pretty quickly. Once cells are infected, uh, they recognize typically that they're infected. And there are a whole variety of mechanisms that cells have evolved to fight viruses. Um, so there are um, what are called PAMPs, which are, are molecular signatures of both bacteria and viruses um, that uh, cells will bind to and will initiate uh, a whole variety of, uh, of responses. Um, sometimes they will uh, chain, will try to block the viral entry. So they'll actually try to block the membrane from uh, pulling the virus in. Uh, sometimes they will interfere, they will block uh, DNA or RNA synthesis within the cell. Um, and they sometimes they'll change the, cyto the, the, the infected cell cytoskeleton. Uh, to try to uh, in, impair, that, that's often the case with the bacteria and with uh, fungal infection, uh, to try to fight the, the bacteria the fungus. Um, so there are a whole variety of responses um, that, that can happen uh, in response to, to infection. 
And there are also a variety, because that's the way there are a variety of chemical signals that, that signal that there's an infection. Um, uh, here are some examples. Uh, again, these are not my slides. So I'm talking through Sam's slides. Uh, components of bacterial cell wall are recognized by cells. Um, lipopolysaccharides are recognized by cells. Um, double-stranded uh, DNA shouldn't be in the cytoplasm of cells. So if the cell sees that there's double-stranded DNA in the cytoplasm, it typically recognizes that it's, um, I'm sorry, double-stranded RNA, I said, uh, that it, it shouldn't be in the cytoplasm. It recognizes that it's uh, infected. Uh, if there's DNA in the cytoplasm, it also recognizes it's infected. Um, and there are a variety of chemical uh, relaying pathways uh, that uh, respond. Uh, the toll-like receptors and the rig eye receptors are, are particularly uh, involved in this kind of relaying. Uh, and one of the things that they do is they promote the production of uh, cell signaling molecules called cytokines. Uh, and cytokines uh, do a whole variety of things. Some of them act directly on the cell, uh, but other ones call in immune cells. They can be uh, chemokines uh, where they attract uh, immune cells of various kinds. Others send signals to neighboring cells, warning them that there's an infection. Uh, molecules like uh, uh, interferon do that. Uh, and then there are, yet again, uh, cytokines that send signals <coughs> to the uh, lymph nodes, uh, instructing the lymph nodes to activate production of uh, T cells and other immune uh, defense mechanisms. And so the, the cellular response to infection is quite complex. Uh, we're not going to... Uh, go into great detail about it today. In fact, we're not going to really think about uh, the signaling in much detail. Um, another thing that happens, and this is, those are all components of the innate immune system. Uh, another thing that happens is that when a cell is infected with a virus, uh, in general, it cannot clear the virus. The only way for an, uh, your body to uh, eliminate a virus is to kill every cell that's infected with the virus. And so one of the reasons that a disease like HIV is so difficult to get rid of is that the virus doesn't kill the cells that it infects or doesn't do it rapidly. Uh, and so uh, there are infected cells that are present in your body for a very long period of time. In the case of influenza, uh, when you're done with, when you're over the flu, your body has eliminated every cell in your body that had the flu virus in it. Every cell that got flu virus in you died uh, by the time you recover from the flu. Uh, one of the concerns with, with COVID was that the virus might lurk, uh, for example, in the gut, in the cells in the gut, uh, and remain uh, latent so that you could then have an outbreak of the virus later. And I don't know where that hypothesis is in terms of testing. Uh, but in general, once the cell is infected, the virus is going to die. Uh, when the cell dies, uh, the cells can die in a variety of ways. Um, there are two classic uh, names for cell death which are apoptosis and necrosis. Uh, necrosis typically occurs when the cell uh, either runs out of energy uh, and uh, bursts because the water pumps that keep the cell uh, functional stop. Uh, in that case, the cell literally, you'll see the cell, if you look under a microscope, the cell will swell up and burst like a, like a balloon. Uh, it's also possible for the virus to replicate so much that it bursts the wall of the cell. Lytic viruses do that. Uh, COVID is not a lytic virus. Uh, but another effect that the uh, signaling molecules that, that are triggered by the virus do 
is they induce organized cell death, apoptosis. And so apoptosis is a classic mechanism of cell death where the cell is not simply run over by a truck, uh, but actually is committing orderly suicide. And during apoptosis, uh, the cell will chop up its DNA uh, and will package its components. Um, and those packaged components uh, are presented to macrophages. The macrophages eat those components and they then change their behavior into what are called antigen presenting cells. And the whole point of that rather elaborate dance of apoptosis and macrophage uh, engulfment of components is that the macrophage now has pieces of the virus. And this is how uh, vaccines work also. Uh, the macrophage now has pieces of the virus. Um, and I guess I should, I, I should maybe skip some of the detail here. Uh, the, and that, that macrophage will become what's called an antigen presenting cell. And it will then migrate to the lymph nodes and it will present those antigens uh, to the cells there, to the T cells and the B cells there. And it will stimulate uh, production of T cells and B cells that specifically bind to that antigen. Uh, so then uh, T cells and B cells that recognize that particular viral component uh, then will proliferate and you'll have what's called an adaptive immune response. In the case of T cells, those T cells will then migrate back into the tissue uh, where they will attack host cells, your cells, that have the viral components on their surfaces and kill them. Uh, in the case of B cells, uh, the cells will begin to produce antibodies that recognize those viral components. And there are multiple classes of antibodies, it's reasonably complicated, uh, but uh, in the case of the, a vaccine like the vaccine for COVID, uh, you'll produce immunoglobin B uh, antibodies uh, in response to the uh, vaccine. The Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are messenger RNA vaccines. They go into your cells, they tell your cells to produce the spike protein, which is the protein the virus uses to bind to the cell membrane receptor, to, to, to ACE2. Uh, they'll produce uh, that protein. Uh, that protein will get, uh, through this mechanism, will get to your lymph nodes and stimulate the production of antibodies and T cells that recognize that spike protein. Uh, it's worth saying that, that um, apoptosis is a critical part of uh, defense against viral infection. And there are many ways that the virus, can, that, that the cell can uh, initiate apoptosis uh, due to uh, viral infection. Uh, one of them, again, is the signaling through cytokines. Uh, another one is that the virus, it will turn on molecules that are associated with apoptosis. Uh, a third one is that the viral production itself can dysregulate uh, the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, which can lead to apoptosis. You can also dysregulate um, the mitochondria, which can lead to apoptosis. Uh, it is also mentioned here that it can cause uh, nuclear uh, dysregulation, which can cause apoptosis as well. If the cell is able to recognize that it's infected and go through the apoptotic process before it begins to release virus, then the virus can't spread at all because uh, the virus requires the, me the mechanisms of cell replication, uh, protein synthesis and cell replication uh, to be able to proliferate. <clears throat> and so uh, 
if the cell is able to kill itself during the eclipse phase, then in principle, there's no viral production. And here, uh, Sam has a, a diagram of some of the apoptotic pathways uh, that are induced by viruses. Um, they're what are called toll-like receptors uh, and trail uh, that uh, use caspase-8, particular molecular species aren't that important, uh, activate CAP2, CAP7, uh, which induces apoptosis. Uh, another thing that they can do here, which I mentioned already, is they can lead to dysregulation of the endoplasmic reticulum uh, or cellular mitochondria. And both of those then lead to cell death as well. However, uh, if cells were able to block viruses that way, successfully, we wouldn't have them. So there's an arms race, which is that the cells try to a cell recognizes that it's infected. It tries to, uh, typically will try to kill itself. But the virus itself, in order to survive and replicate in, your ho in the host, has to be able to at least keep the rate of cell death slow enough that there's some viral production. And so, uh, almost every virus human virus uh, will produce proteins uh, which interfere with apoptosis. And so here's a list that uh, Sam came up with uh, of uh, a variety of viruses. And the point of this slide is just to illustrate that there are many, many different mechanisms uh, by which cells can be sig triggered to, to die in response to the virus. And the viruses have come up with molecular strategies to turn those off. Uh, and the heterogeneity of that is really quite breathtaking. P53 is one of the master regulators of apoptosis. And so if a virus can turn off apoptosis, uh, through P by blocking P53, it's going to be very effective at hiding in cells. Um, dysregulation of P53 is associated and is critical in most solid tumors. And so in most uh, cancer cells, uh, P53 is dysregulated. And you'll notice that if you look at the viruses that uh, uh, directly inactivate or block P53, um, several of these are associated with cancer. Uh, papillomavirus, particularly it's cancer uh, inducing virus. Hepatitis B can cause liver cancer. I don't actually know about simian virus 40. I don't know whether that's cancer associated or not. Um, herpes virus is also associated with a tumor formation and potentially cancer. And so uh, there's a slightly dangerous game here, which is the short-term survival of the virus, uh, but, and it's, it's playing with uh, cell death, uh, but can also have the longer-term effect of, of inducing uh, cancer. There was a, there was a discussion. Back when I was a student 30, 35 years ago, uh, there was a lot of discussion about viruses that were um, basically cancer inducers. And they can be cancer inducers in a variety of ways. There are viruses, DNA viruses, uh, where the viral genome gets uh, integrated into the host genome. One of the good things, if they're good, good things, about uh, RNA viruses like influenza and uh, COVID is that uh, your body doesn't store genetic information as RNA. Uh, and that means that the virus can't integrate itself into your, your genome, uh, which is why things like people thinking that 
that the uh, vaccines were changing their genome were sort of strange. Uh, the RNA doesn't integrate your genome, and therefore uh, it can't last a very long time without some very special mechanisms at work. A DNA virus, on the other hand, uh, potentially can integrate itself into your genome and it's there forever. Uh, could be latent or could be active, but if it's latent, it can sit there forever and uh, reactivate when you're immunosuppressed or something else happens. Uh, retroviruses are a little bit special because even though they transmit their information as RNA, <laughs> they have tools that copy RNA back into DNA. And again, that allows the virus like HIV to, to lurk in cells in a way that a single-stranded positive RNA virus like, uh, like uh, influenza or COVID can't do. The, in general, your body doesn't copy RNA into DNA. And so it was a big shock when they discovered retroviruses. It wasn't thought that that kind of thing would exist. And it's not that long ago that they were discovered. Okay. So now, after all of that discussion, uh, just the way we added uh, D death to our uh, to our epidemiological models, we're now going to add cell death to our model of viral infection. And so. Uh, once the cell is infected by the virus, again, there's no, in general, there's no cure for the cell. The cell is doomed the moment the virus gets into it. Uh, but there's some time over which the cell will survive. And that time is dangerous because that's the time the infected cell is producing virus. Um, that lifetime is partly determined autonomously because of the mechanisms we discussed by which the cell uh, kills itself after it's seen that it's infected. Sometimes the cell will die necrotically <coughs> where the cell virus simply uses up all of the cell's resources and the cell runs out of energy. <coughs> to me. And the third way, <coughs> that the cell can die is that it can attract uh, uh, innate immune cells like natural killer cells that uh, circulate in the body, look for infected cells and kill them. The difference between an innate immune cellular response like a natural killer cell and an adaptive immune response like a CD8 plus T cell is that the innate cell, like the NK, NK cell, will kill any infected cell uh, with relatively low specificity and relatively weak targeting. Uh, and the, CD4, the CD8 plus T cell has a molecule on it that specifically recognizes that virus. Uh, and so it's much more targeted. Uh, for our purposes, we're just going to assume that the infected cells the I2 cells, those uh, virus releasing cells have a lifetime and that they decay into dead cells. So I2 goes to D, what we're going to add. Um, and we have to look at the uh, lifetime and we need an estimate of that. And, and estimates for the lifetime of infected cells vary a lot, depends on the tissue, depends on the individual and so on. Uh, but the typical uh, lifetime we can begin with uh, for uh, influenza is about four days. Might actually be a little less than that, but four days isn't a terrible start. And for SARS-CoV-2, the initial lifetime is about two days. And as always, what we need are rates rather than uh, lifetimes. So the rate will be one over the lifetime. So if the cell lives for four days after infection, the death rate of the cell would be about 0.24 per day. 
if the cell lives for two days after infection, the lifetime would be about 0.05, or 0 0.5 uh, per day. <clears throat> Um, I've cheated a little bit because I know a, a rate of uh, two to, uh, four days corresponding to 0 0.24 per day uh, will give about the right answer. Um, but uh, in fact, it's probably about half of that. So now we'll do our first real exercise for it taking a while to get to this, uh, but let's do it together. Um, I'd like you to add a cell death to your model. So add a decay term where I2 cells become dead at a rate D times I2. And you can try uh, a death rate of 0 0.24 per day. Infected cells live for four days. Or of 0.5. Infected cells live for two days and let me know what you get, okay? If there are any questions about that, about that little exercise, let me know. So again, if you finish with the exercise early, uh, try changing that lifetime, the D value, and see what happens. What does it do to the viral load and what does it do to the cell the cell uh, number. So I'll let you work on it too, but I'll add this to the code. And if you're, again, if you're, if you're finished already, then, then play with the parameter values and try to get a sense of what they're doing. Anybody want to report what they got? Um, I can show mine if you want. Sure. I stole the code uh, for my project so we can. That works. That's I, why I, I remind people always that. that you should keep the code that you write. Well, the code you write in one class, you should keep for another. If you have better code that you've written for something else and homework or for the project, by all means, keep it. 
Oh, that's great. So that so D there is the, the cells are lasting 10 days. Okay, great. And now there they're lasting about two days. And let's see, which one is the virus? Let's say which okay, blue. So maybe why don't we turn everything off except the virus? Great. This is great. This is a much better code for demoing things than what I have. Okay, so if you make the virus, um, if you make the lifetime longer, short, okay, so there the cells last, of basically there there's no cell death. So the, so the virus shows up and it stays. And now you begin to turn the cell death on and the virus eventually goes away. And the shorter the lifetime of the cells, the faster the virus goes away. Makes sense. Um, and if, you, if you do the log scale, you'll notice that now we have that slow decrease of viral load that we see in the flu. And in our in our in our um, in our experimental data set, the the it the uh, amount of virus went down by a factor of ten over about six days. So let's see what the value of D that we need is to get that to happen. So it peaks around day two. Uh, what we want is day eight we want the amount of virus to be 10 to the fifth about. So let's see if we can just slide D back and forth to get the amount of virus on day eight to be about 10 to the fifth. So that's a little bit, a little, it's, that's a little too fast. That's pretty good, maybe a little bit bigger than that. So tiny point, point three five. pretty close, maybe 0.5. I'd say point four. That's a little, yeah, I'd say point five. Yeah. So so if the it, so if 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 we guess that the that cells live about two days with the virus, that gives us a curve that's pretty compatible with the experiment for the employees. So so what I'm trying to get. Uh, to give you a sense of, I don't know how well it's coming across, is that we started with an experimental data set. We're building step by step, basically going through time. The first thing that happens is not there's there's a delay until we produce virus. So we put that in. Then we generate virus exponentially with some rate of increase. We put that in. And we fit those parameters one at a time. Then we said there's a saturation of the virus. So we put that in, fit that parameter. And now we're saying that after that's happened, the amount of virus decreases slowly in time due to cell death. And now we're putting that in. And so now we actually have come up with a model without the fancy fitting that Giuliano and Josh showed you how to do, just by hand, pulling our knobs, we come up with a model that replicates the initial phase one delay, the exponential growth, the saturation, and now the slow decay. And I think that's pretty impressive that by looking at the problem and thinking about it a bit, you can actually come up with a model that works pretty well to, regular, to replicate the experimental data. Now, if we weren't doing influenza, and so the viral load curve had some very complicated shape, we'd have a much harder time. But in the case of influenza, you can actually do it by hand. You don't need fancy, fancy fitting to be able to do it. So that's great. Thank you, Drew. That was really helpful. Okay, so
Okay, so what we got was two. So, so when we had a lifetime of two uh, days, so that would be d equals 0 0.5. We got that the k that we needed for the for the model one. And so now we've actually been able to replicate one, two, three, four components of the of our life cycle. And we know the numbers. Um, the infection rate of four, um, the production rate of one. Uh, the viral clearance rate of 10, about, and the decay rate of about 1.5. So to go further, to go further, we have to now begin to think about the adaptive immune response. And, and the, to get to get this tail in zone five <clears throat> winds up being quite a bit of work. And uh, the model that I'm going to show you isn't the greatest model in the world for this. Um, because the, the things that we've done so far are already uh, great simplifications of reality, uh, but they're, they're anchored in they're anchored in, in uh, reasonable experimental hypothesis. Uh, when we start dealing with the adaptive immune system, uh, we, we're gonna face a number of problems. One of those problems is gonna be that there actually are real delays, uh, that it takes time for the uh, macrophages to scavenge, the cells that have died turn into antigen presenting cells. It takes time for them to go to the lymph nodes. And in the lymph nodes, it takes time for the uh, T cells to replicate. And so uh, it may not sound comp particularly problematic, but there are no adaptive immune cells uh, at all before day five or six. Uh, and one of the things, just the way we were talking about the fact that you can't run uh, models in parallel in, in Tellurium, one of the things that you can't do numerically in Tellurium is solve what are called delay equations. If I wanted the rate in E2, to depend not on I1 at time now, but at I1 in the past. Uh, I can't do that. I can't write I1 of T minus 10, 10. Um, and part of the reason for that is a numerical one that so-called delay equations, that is ordinary differential equations where the right-hand side, the variables are not at the current time, but at past times, uh, have in, intrinsically uh, numerical problems in their solution. Uh, the solution of a delay equation principle an infinite dimensional problem. And uh, often an ill-posed problem. Uh, and they are potentially numerically unstable. And that means that the simple uh, numerical solvers that Tellurium uses may not work. Now, in practice, the particular kinds of delays we're dealing with are pretty benign. And so uh, it would work if we could express them, but Tellurium doesn't give us a language for expressing them. And so delay equations are a, a case where uh, a, la a language like Mathematica uh, can handle it. Uh, of course, Wolfram and company spent billions of dollars developing the code to do that. Um, 
Tellurium was written by three people, uh, four people. And so you can't, you can't expect the same numerical sophistication in Tellurium that you have uh, in Mathematica. MATLAB has some packages for solving delay equations. But for the moment, we're gonna live with it. I will talk a little bit about how to do a sort of a poor man's delay equation. Uh, probably not today, but in the next in the next slide. And so now we have to come to the the biological complexity of what happens in the adaptive immune system because that's what's causing that cut off in the chain. And I mentioned already that that the uh, that the When, when infected cells die through apoptosis, uh, they turn, they release uh, blebs, uh, which have uh, viral proteins in them. Those viral proteins are scavenged by <coughs> macrophages. Those macrophages then become dendritic cells, uh, and those dendritic cells actually migrate out of the tissue, uh, where uh, they find the material, the, the, the debris from the dead cells. They migrate out of the tissue into the lymphatic system. And perhaps it's worth saying a word or two about the lymphatic system. We're very used to thinking about the blood vessels in our body. And we think about the network of blood vessels in our body as a, as a tree, a vascular tree. Uh, there's a second network of vessels uh, which uh, carry lymph uh, and that are in many ways analogous to blood vessels. They tend to be smaller. Um, and they don't get talked about nearly as much. If you're not dealing with the immune system, typically you ignore the lymphatic system. Uh, in the kidney, you also have the, the uh, blood vessels that carry bile, uh, which are also not talked about very much. And uh, the fact that there's this second uh, tree of, of vessels in your body uh, can be rather important uh, because in particular, uh, cancer cells can migrate through not only the bloodstream, but also through the lymphatic system. And so one of the classic hallmarks of a bad outcome for cancer, metastatic cancer, is that the cancer will show up in the lymph nodes. So the lymph nodes are a series of organs that are distributed in a variety of places in your body, uh, in your throat, uh, in your armpits, in your groin, and elsewhere, uh, that are a repeated organ system uh, that handles your in the main part of your immune response, not all of it, but the main part of your immune response. And uh, in humans, in mammals, uh, the lymphatic system is not actively pumped. However, uh, there are uh, one-way valves in the, lymph in the, in the lymphatic uh, vessels. Uh, and the movement of your body uh, is sufficient to actually pump lymph pretty fast. Uh, it's not as fast as blood flow, but it moves pretty fast. Um, and so it used to be thought that a lot of the delay in the adaptive immune system was the time it took for dendritic cells to get from uh, the tissue back to the lymph nodes. In fact, no, no parts of your body are very far from the lymph node. Um, and the uh, dendritic cells move pretty fast uh, in the lymphatic system. Uh, so it's hours rather than days for them to find their targets. Uh, once the uh, dendritic cells get to the lymph nodes, uh, they have to present their antigen to the cells in the lymph node to see if they recognize it. And then the lymph node has to change its architecture to replicate those particular cell types. And so there's an amplification there, and that takes quite a while. Once they, those cells have replicated, uh, they either release uh, antibodies into the environment, 
uh, or if there are things like uh, CD8 uh, plus T cells, uh, those CD8 plus T cells will migrate back through the lymphatic system into uh, or through the bloodstream in some cases uh, into the tissue uh, to attack infected cells. And so it's a pretty complicated system and there isn't really much we can do to simplify it. Uh, but the basic idea is in the tissue, there's a delay because the cells that are infected have to die and they have to be scavenged by macrophages. There's a delay because the macrophages have to mature into dendritic cells in the tissue. Once they've done that, they have to then find the lymph nodes, lymphatic system, and migrate to the lymph nodes, which takes time. Once they're in the lymph nodes, they have to present to the cells in the lymph nodes. It doesn't take that much time. And then those cells to which they presented have to replicate, which takes time because cells don't replicate infinitely fast. The fastest cycle time for mammalian cells is about six to 12 hours. And you need to have them not just double once, but you need 10 or 20 generations of doubling. That takes time. And then once those cells are produced, they have to migrate back to the tissue, which takes time, although not that long. But the main delay is the maturation of the dendritic cells and the time it takes for the cells to replicate in the lymphatics. And now there are other kinds of cells also that are turned on. Some of them are mentioned here. Um, uh, it talks about um, as, uh, cytotoxic lymphocytes, um, macrophages, uh, memory T cells, and, and B cells, which store the, the immune memory system. And if you want more detail, there's this discussion of naive T cells uh, and their activation to form. Uh, Form and uh, CDA clusters. Um, perhaps this is too much. This is perhaps this is too much detail. Uh, I don't know if people have had courses in biology and if people know how the immune system works. Um, there's a, a rather complicated history for T cells in particular. Um, which is that they start out in the bone marrow. Um, they then migrate to the thymus uh, where they're selected. So one of, the, one of the great mysteries, since we're gonna run out of time, maybe it's worth talking a little bit biology. Uh, one of the great mysteries 30 years ago was what was called self non self recognition, which is how do your, your immune cells are working by killing cells in your body. These T cells are having to come in, they're having to kill infected cells. And so that means you're producing cells that are killing your cells. And if you've heard of an auto, if you've ever had heard of or had an autoimmune disease, uh, you know that the immune cells in your body sometimes kill cells they shouldn't kill. And so one of the big mysteries for a long time was how do immune cells know which cells to kill? If they don't kill enough, if they're too careful, then the virus or the bacteria will take over and kill you by replicating without limit. If they're not careful enough, they'll go in and they'll attack normal tissue and they'll kill you through your own immune response. And in the case of, of influenza, most of the illness that you feel is not from the influenza. The, most of the illness that you feel is from your body's immune response. It's not from the virus itself. Now, if the, your virus didn't mount an immune response, you'd die from the influenza. But in fact, the influenza is mostly gone by the time you're feeling sick. And so one of the, one of the interesting things that, that has to happen is that, uh, so another aspect of the immune system, adaptive immune system that maybe is important to mention is that it's not that your body creates 
immune cells that recognize the virus components de novo. Uh, early on in your life, your body generates immune cells with a whole variety. It's one of the few places in your body where the DNA is actually edited. So uh, in uh, the precursors to immune cells, there are uh, highly variable regions of DNA that are effectively overwritten and randomized so that the immune cell precursors have uh, essentially quasi-random DNA that is going to code for the antibody receptors. And uh, your body then has a store of immune cells that are potentially able to recognize something. Now, whether those immune cells recognize something useful or not is, is an open question. Um, the bone marrow generates the naive T cells. Each naive T cell is got DNA in it that allows it to recognize something, but whether that something is the thing you need or not, you don't know. The job of the thymus is primarily to get rid of those immune T cells that recognize the molecules in the body too well. You don't want immune cells to be, that, that recognize your liver to be running around because they will go and they would destroy your liver. And so the thymus's job is to filter these randomly generated immune cells and look for ones that are accidentally recognizing the body and get rid of them. Once they've done that, those filtered immune cells then go to the lymph nodes and they sit there and they sit there for a very long time. Uh, in humans, the thymus never disappears completely, but it's primarily active in children and adolescents. By the time you're 20 years old, uh, your thymus is shrunk. By the time you're my age, which is 60, your thymus is tiny. And that means that when you're elderly, you're not generating new immune cell possibilities very much. And that's one of the reasons that in the elderly, the immune response is weaker. Because you can't generate the new responses, the things that you haven't recognized. So in the lymph nodes, we have these CD4 plus T cells that are sitting there. So sorry, the naive the CD4 plus cells. Uh, they're sitting there. Uh, when the antigen presenting cell comes in, if by accident that cell recognizes the antigen on the antigen presenting cell, then it's stimulated to proliferate. And it can proliferate in a variety of ways. Uh, and you've got some of those here. And so the, the, we're going to focus just on the lymph node. We're going to assume that some time in the distant past, there were uh, precursor and naive T cells generated. Uh, those naive T cells were filtered out to get rid of the uh, self-recognizing ones and that they've come into the lymph nodes. So we're going to neglect this earlier phase of the immune response. This, this happens, this earlier phase of the immune response happen independent of infection or part of development. And so you've heard me use these jargon terms before. Uh, the ones that we're really going to focus on here are these CD8 plus T cells. Um, which are the ones that actually go around and kill their targets. In reality, it's not so simple even as that, which is already not so simple. Uh, there are uh, CD4 plus T cells, uh, which typically have to be involved in order to um, get the CD8 plus T cells to do their killing. And this is uh, part of the body's defense mechanism to prevent the CD8, cell, T, CD8 plus T cells from running amok. Uh, over, over 
when people die of cytokine storms, uh, one of the things that can be happening is, is that the CD8 plus T cells are running amok. Uh, natural killer cells also can, can wind up doing a lot of damage. Uh, and so the CD4 plus T cells basically help um, guide the CD8 plus T cells to kill in the right places. Uh, and then there also are T regs, which are regulatory T cells, and they, as it says, help shut down the T cell response. And again, the problem is that once the CD8 plus T cells start killing, uh, they don't just kill the target cells, they kill cells around the target cells uh, to basically create a safety margin. Uh, and that can cause uh, runaway tissue damage inflammation, runaway inflammation that leads to, 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 tissue, to, to necrosis of the tissue and eventually death of individuals. And, and certainly with, with COVID, when people are dying of COVID, it may be vascular disruption, uh, but effectively what's happening is you're dying not from the COVID, but from the immune response to the COVID. But there's an excessive, excessive adaptive immune response that's causing you to die. And so this shutdown mechanism is very important. We're not going to be modeling in detail, but if somebody really wanted to be, uh, to think about how the future of modeling worked, uh, modeling the shutdown of the immune system is something that really needs to be studied a lot more. So the other place you'll run into Tregs is in cancer because cancer cells are bot or self, but they often are different enough that your immune system recognizes them as foreign and kills them. Uh, and if you've heard of immunotherapies that's effectively trying to, trying to create uh, CD8 plus T cells that are gonna go in and kill cancer cells. Um, many cancers, attract uh, Tregs that protect the tumor from being killed by the immune system. And so in the case of a cancer, you don't have a virus that's trying to escape your immune system, but your body's own cells are escaping immune regulation. And uh, that one of the, the uh, one of the um, applications from last year that was presented the other day um, that we are talking about uh, was a, a student who was doing a paper, uh, re reproducing a paper which was studying uh, radiation therapy and, uh, and uh, immunotherapy. Uh, and Tregs are one of the issues there. Uh, if we didn't have Tregs, Every time we had an immune response, we die. So they're essential. But if they're overactive, they can cause problems. All right. And so now uh, we have to think about all of this complexity. Um, and we're going to try to build a very simple model of it. And the model that we're going to build, which we're not going to do today, uh, is not the greatest. Uh, it's one that I wrote, and I didn't. didn't um, if I were going to do it again, I probably wouldn't do it quite the same way I did it before. Uh, but the basic idea that we're going to uh, try to model is this concept that in the lungs, there are cells that uh, recognize the infected cells. They're going to move to the lymph nodes. They're going to send a signal causing the proliferation of immune cells in the lymph node. Those immune cells in the lymph nodes are going to go through the bloodstream or in the lymphatic system. They're going to come back to the tissue and they're then going to kill the infected cells and get rid of the virus. And so next time we will come back uh, and we will begin to build uh, a little model of the signal, which is signal from the lungs, goes to the lymph nodes, causes production of cells in the lymph nodes. Those cells come back 
and clear up the virus. And all of that is going to be trying to get this cutoff of the virus around day seven. And that seven day to 10 day window is absolutely diagnostic of the adaptive immune system. The time it takes for the signal to get to the lymph nodes, mainly for the cells in the lymph nodes to proliferate, and then for the, those cells to come back to the tissue is about a minimum of seven days. So you don't have any adaptive immune response before seven days in what's called primary infection if, you, if you're getting in disease for the first time. Once you've had the disease, there will be cells both in the tissue and in the lymph nodes that are primed to recognize that pathogen. And so the second time you get the influenza, the second time you get COVID, your immune response, your adaptive immune response is much more rapid than it is the first time. In the case of a couple of diseases like dengue, the second time you get it, your adaptive immune response is so strong and so fast it causes a problem. And so there are occasionally are diseases where the second, usually the second time you get a virus, it's less severe than the first time because of your adaptive immune system. There are a few cases where it's worse. Okay, I've talked my time out. Uh, next time we'll start building that model. Uh, if you are not so comfortable with what we've done so far, uh, some people clearly have some very good, have a nice technology for this. Um, why don't you uh, play with the uh, simple model that we've done so far uh, to reproduce these parts of our curve? Uh, and then next time, uh, I'd encourage you to read up a little bit about the adaptive immune system. Juliano, maybe if you can find a good review article that we could send around to everybody to think about some of the components of the immune system, that would be very helpful.